Good evening, everyone. I just want to set up uh, the next one. Um, I want to start off by saying, um, hi, my name's Dion. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, this is actually what happened at a diversity and inclusivity conference I went to in New York. Um, and this is kind of what, where the state of the world is. Um, what I'm going to present to you tonight, I'm going to probably speak a little bit too fast because uh, the full trend briefing, which we're actually launching only in two weeks' time, um, you're going to get a little bit of a glimpse of that. Um, so I'm going to try and condense an hour into 20 minutes. Um, and I've also got to go through six pillars. So the state we're in is something that we do at Flux every single year. We start every year with that. And we use the acronym TRENDS. So T for technology, R for retail and marketing trends, E for the state of the economy, N the natural world, D for diplomacy, and S for social and cultural trends. Um, we theme it every year. And you'll see on your screens, um, it's a rather profound uh, mouthful of the politics of rage and polarization, the quest for middle ground. Um, I chose this title because we've kind of kissed common ground um, away last year. So really, how did we get here? So I don't know if you've seen the doomsday clock. It's been going for, since 1947. Uh, it's been moved to 100 seconds before midnight, and that's just when Armageddon just goes, um, and we all go into our bunkers with wrapping tinfoil around our heads and hope for the best down there. Um, but also the Pantone color for 2020 is a dusk blue, and that's not insignificant because um, if you know, if you go into any airline, most of the airline uh, uniforms are in a navy blue. It's a uh, it's a, it's a color of authority, it's a calming color, so we're trying to calm people down, um, and that's why the Pantone color was that. But let me start with the, the first pillar, the, the trends one. Um, I think it's interesting to note that um, if you are binge watching, um, and uh, the Oscar season's about to come through, that from one or two movies that were in, uh, on the Oscar season last year with Roma, um, we now have about 14, so things are really a changing. Um, but Netflix can also offer you a watching speed of one and a half times faster than the actual thing. So we're trying to binge watch and we're trying to watch one and a half times faster than the actual movie actually plays out. So things are going to get a little bit messy. Um, one of the things that was important for uh, CES, so we, everybody kind of looks at technology in terms of the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and the Samsung keynote this year was about the age of experience. We are kind of going to be one with our devices and with our technology, and we are looking for experience. If you're in retail, you know the whole thing about experiential marketing. That's what we want to do. But I'm going to go through a few different experiences. So um, with Bronwyn's long view of the future. Um, I w had my uh, great pleasure of going to Amsterdam in December to attend the Amsterdam Drone Week. And what this is, um, is a, the EU discussing the future of air mobility. So um, what you're seeing on screen here is one of the first drone, that you'll see Volo ports. It's the first drone taxi uh, simulation that they did in Singapore last year. So. It is a near reality. We're getting there closer and closer. All of the, the, the speakers were talking about 2023, 2025. Um, and in essence, it's a slightly easier, I said that in parentheses, and slightly easier new trend or new technology to, to, to kind of regulate because we have airspace. And everyone says, you know, especially if you come from South Africa, how on earth are we going to have flying taxis? If you look at our taxis as we have now, um, but you're not going to be driving your own or flying your own taxi. Um, it's going to be very, very uh, controlled. Um, they're already doing um, a lot of grids, um, and it's actually, uh, there was a, a, a a talk by, by Boeing, um, and they've worked out a grid. So if you go back into your science fiction archives and you look at the fifth element um, and you're seeing those cars uh, on a grid, the flying cars on a grid, we're kind of going to get there within the next decade. So what you're going to see with all of these technologies is what's happening now, 2020, but also what's going to happen in the next decade. So we're on an inter interesting um, threshold of that near or long future as well. Um, driverless cars are already with us. And again, it's not going to be driverless cars that are just buzzing around um, the streets. That might come. But what you're seeing on screen is what's going to happen in Tokyo uh, at the Olympics this year. Um, 
in 2019 already driverless shuttle services. So you'll see your driverless shuttle services within a contained environment. Um, they started from airport terminal to airport terminal. You'll see it in um, enclosed businesses from parking lot to different buildings. Um, the Navy Brooklyn Yard uh, outside just off Manhattan uh, started their service in August last year. Helsinki started theirs in March uh, 2019. There's a, um, an, a retirement village in Australia um, that started those things. So those are our realities. So the flying taxis um, are the next version. Um, what is quite scary was a quote from Cisco a couple of years ago that said, by 2020, we are going to have seven times more connected devices than there are people on the planet. So basically, that's like seven uh, devices just for every one person to, to do that. Um, but there is going to be this connectivity, and there's a big push for it. So RAIN in South Africa is the first uh, rollout of 5G, um, and it's going to roll out uh, much more in 2020. Um, Google has started giving Wi-Fi hotspots um, in different areas in, in uh, Cape Town. And then there's a company called um, Linkshore. It's a Chinese company that are already launching 10. By the end of this year, there'll be 10 satellites in orbit. And by, the, by 2025 or 2030, by the end of the, the decade, there's going to be hundreds of these uh, satellites that are orbiting the world. And it's all going to give us free uh, connectivity. So while we're getting more and more connect connectivity, we're also going to push back in terms of privacy because we know we're swapping uh, our uh, privacy and, uh, and our convenience um, for a bit of free Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi is kind of everything. If we go into retail, there's an interesting flip on that. So overall, 2020, you've seen the convergence of three big uh, things. It's um, geopolitical issues that are starting to impact on, on, on business, um, sustainability in business, and then sustainability uh, coming up from the vanguards of your Greta Thunbergs um, and, and the like. And in retail and marketing, this is kind of the at the forefront um, of everything, is just sustainability, 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 but also rentals. So at Flux, we started looking at this, the, what we call the transient economy, um, since 2012. So if you've caught an Uber, if you've booked an Airbnb, the sharing economy is what we're starting to get through. So you're starting to see rentals becoming a new normal. Um, what's on the screen is, is a... a, a, a kind of a slow mushrooming of rental kitchens or shared kitchens within Asia. So you're starting to get uh, people that are, are living together within a compound or a smaller community and they're built around a shared kitchen. So it's getting the connectivity back again, um, but sharing your resources. One of the biggest um, shifts in terms of a business model um, has been clothing rentals. So uh, Rent the Runway, 10-year-old company in America, um, they started off with not a hugely innovative um, uh, uh, business model, but two years ago, your big brands like Levi's started saying, could you put some of our inventory on to Rent the Runway? And if I told you five years ago that if I was going to go into clothing retail and all I didn't want to do was actually just rent you and not sell you the stuff, you would have said, well, that's ridiculous. Dion, what are you smoking or are you drinking too much of that CBD mineral water that they gave you backstage? So it's starting to be that. And with digital nomads in terms of a new workforce, um, you're going to move around the world. You can, uh, IKEA has started a rental division. So if you're going to be moving from country to country and not staying there for very long, why would you amass assets um, and actually buy furniture, buy a car, buy your clothes? You just rent um, everything. So, and then rental kitchens come through with that. And then the big one in terms of sustainability is the war on plastics. Um, that has scaled so fast within the last 18 months. You're seeing everyone from uh, Woolworth to a pick and pay um, in South Africa having naked food walls so that you can uh, go there without your plastics. Um, in Thailand, they're wrapping things in banana leaves. There is this huge, huge pressure on companies to say uh, you can't uh, do this. Um, and it's very surprising that just last week at Davos, um, you know, Coca-Cola has been one of the companies that they said, uh, you are the worst polluters on the planet. And the head of sustainability actually stands up at Davos and says, um, we're not going to get rid of our plastic bottles because our customers like them. So we're going to see where that conversation goes. That will be an interesting one. Um, but things are going to get really, really um, 
uh, interesting, but new innovations start up almost every day. So one of the things on our radar are little pills that you use as toothpaste. So every single, listen to this, every single toothpaste tube ever made and that what you are going to buy now is never been recycled. Every single toothpaste tube ever in history is in a landfill now. Um, it's just because of the materials, you can't do that. So what they've invented is a little tablet that you put into your mouth and with water it starts frothing up and you can do that. So there's a lot of innovations coming through there. And then quite a weird shift is in the retail sector, um, brand activism has become so strong, um, some of your retail stores, uh, this is the body shop um, there, but Patagonia have also done pop-up shops where they actually give you lectures and talk about uh, um, whatever activism that you're wanting, climate change, uh, sustainability. So your retail um, centers are not becoming not only centers of learning, but little activist hubs, which is a very interesting one. Um, all right, the icky one, the state of economy. So South Africa started out this year uh, facing 8,000 and counting job losses. So uh, we're hearing of the 3,000 at Telcom, another 1,400 at uh, MassMart, uh, the, the, and the mines are starting to, to cut, and we haven't seen it yet. If you just walk through any of our um, shopping malls, you'll see those papered up walls and little pop-up shops of art stalls and things like that. It's not a pretty picture there. Um, but if on a global scale, it's quite interesting. This is when the geopolitical things start interfering with uh, business. So um, Trump started the trade war with China last year, and what they're calling the big decoupling was because of kind of the tech industry and the tech space. So there's also that whole thing about Huawei, uh, you can't, we can't use the 5G because of privacy, all of those kind of things. But what they're saying is about the decoup, the great decoupling is of the global tech companies and the collateral damage are all the people and suppliers in between that are now affected by this trade war and the, the ripple effect is just being starting to see now and in 2020 you're going to see this, this roll out. We don't really know what this new trade deal um, is going to bring but that great decoupling has already started. And what's interesting is now they're saying the de-globalization de of, of, of the planet. So we have kind of uh, spread out and then suddenly we're all coming back um, into it. And they said for several reasons, um, you know, one of which is that they said 93% of the population on Earth are actually in um, world trade uh, organization zones. So they, we, they're sort of saying we've done almost what we can do and we'll see where this, this kind of lands. And what the analysts are saying is what the deglobalization might start doing and with the decoupling and the trade wars and the geopolitical things is regionalization. So you're starting to see this, um, the, the, the curtain between east, west or whichever region and whichever region becomes the powerhouse um, of the world and then the trade is, is being uh, centered there. Um, there's, there's stats about uh, Asia as well that 46 or so of the, the world's um, busiest and most populous cities are going to be in Asia in the next uh, 20, uh, in the next decade. So uh, that powerhouse is very real and when that starts decoupling we'll see where that's going. Um, the other one that uh, re I'm really passionate about and, and what I hammer home with, with clients is the difference between where business is shifting. Retailers have had this, um, they've been at the, the core face of that, they've understood what the, the, the consumers want, uh, worn plastics, different packaging, no straws, all of that kind of stuff, but it's never been the role of big corporate to really uh, do anything except keep the shareholders happy and watch the bottom line. That is changing very, very, very rapidly. So um, your ESG, your um, environmental social governance, um, is completely taking over your, uh, your um, social responsibility, uh, so, um, social responsible investment, um, and everybody's asking what is your ESG uh, rating and do you have a B Corporation listing? So that's the new gold standard um, of companies that are measured on their ESG ratings. It's been quite common in, in sort of mining and, and any other industry that actually damages uh, the environment, but now it's starting to get into very, very different businesses. So you're seeing in investment specifically, so you must have heard on the news, the CEO of BlackRock, one of the, the largest wealth management companies on the planet, um, talking about climate change and about giving preferential investments to companies who have a good ESG rating 
or are doing things that are sustainable. Um, and one of the big things that I picked up last year was Prada. Prada was the first luxury brand um, in the world to get a sustainability loan. So it was with uh, Credit Agricole in France. Uh, they borrowed 50 million euros, and it's a, it's a sustainability loan. So they said, you can have the money, but if you train your staff in this X, Y, and Z, if all of your stores suddenly become LEED certified, um, we will start reducing the interest rates uh, and things like that. So um, it's moving into that space, and even investment hedge funds um, are starting to look at preferential treatment or better um, services to sustainable um, assets and, and that management. So the natural world, which is obviously right in the middle of the sustainability issue, um, we're starting to see, and we've just had all of that uh, very, very visual um, uh, confirmation that if you're still a naysayer, well, I don't know what else is going to really, really push you over the edge about the climate change and what we're seeing. Um, and of course, the big one at the end of last year was um, in Australia. And what just came out this month, um, post the, the, the sort of the most devastating fires was they said Australia is probably going to be the first country that has climate change refugees. So we've had refugees because of political instability, Syrian refugees, but they said the Australian displacement is going to be the first cases of climate change refugees. So it's now become um, a new category. And then we have the lovely coronavirus, which we don't really know what it is. So if you like your dystopian movies, then this one is really for you, uh, because uh, what's it, about 100 and something deaths so far, it's spreading around countries, it's just you get on a plane, and especially at this time, just last weekend, uh, was the Lunar New Year, um, and it is also the biggest human migration on the planet. Nine million people in China go from the coasts, in, back to home inland, just like we do at Christmas. Um, so nine, that's why there were so, so many travel restrictions, but nine million people moving about and not knowing what this mutating virus does and whether it's airborne or uh, whatever. So um, if you're in the surgical mask business, you were doing really, really well uh, last week in China. Um, and then this is an interesting one. So the first byproducts of the grape Great Pacific Garbage Patch, that's quite a mouthful, um, are going to come through in 2020. So if you're not familiar with the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, um, these are these huge swirling masses um, that are literally the size of, of, a, of a huge island um, that is where the world's plastic that goes into the sea gets trapped. And they within cross currents and this this garbage patch just grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So what they're trying to do, so Adidas has done that. Um, they produce shoes out of fishing nets. Um, we're starting to mine that plastic and then start making things um, out of it. So Stella McCartney, also one of the sort of pioneer designers, is working with Adidas um, and they're starting to make circular economy uh, it, within retail. So you take back your trainers, you take back your clothes, um, and what they do is they don't uh, just take it to a landfill, uh, they shred all of the down to the last fiber and re-engineer new fibers to make new shoes make new clothing, um, so a, a circular economy is really where we're going there. Um, the D for diplomacy, that's also a really difficult one this year, but um, you're going to see those forces of sustainability and climate change um, start headbutting specifically with CEOs of big companies because uh, you're used to your short-term profits and, and, and gains, uh, you're looking at shareholder primacy, we look after the shareholders, now suddenly there's all this touchy-feely stuff that you've got to um, put into your business model um, and people are doing that. So the, the, the biggest um, industries that they say are going to be um, affected by this, oil and gas firms, airlines, car makers, um, and meat producers uh, as well, which is why you see this, this uh, surge in plant-based diets that are coming through. Um, and then the geopolitics is going to continue. Um, we saw last year just small little tweets on one side of the planet in support of the uh, protesters in Hong Kong. Suddenly, if you're a multinational company and you've got doing a lot of business, uh, which the NBA did, and it's not even a retail, it's a, it's a you know, basketball franchise, um, they were hit really hard just because of that one tweet 
um, in support of that. And where do you draw the line? So do you, can you speak out or must you just shut up because you don't want to prod the dragon on the other side of the, the planet um, or uh, upset anybody else with that? Um, the one thing that is good is the youngest prime minister has just been appointed um, and five members of her cabinet are all in their 30s and this is a pattern that's starting to go around the world and specifically even in South Africa, our three main parties have young people um, in their 20s or in their 30s standing up and saying, I think we can do things um, differently. However, there is a little bit of a downside to this. Um, so in America last year, um, Katie Hill is the first casualty. She's the first millennial leader who had to resign because nude pictures of her surfaced on the internet. Um, so if you just go back into our sort of social media history, um, all of the social media platforms that we love and adore so much were all spawned round about 2005. So even millennials who are now in managerial and leadership positions had to get used to this thing called social media and oversharing or not oversharing and uh, porn revenge and everything like that. Um, so now, if this generation is now going into leadership positions, then what about that digital history? Um, is it going to come back and haunt them um, or not? And we'll see if there are more Cater Hills that come through. Um, last pillar, sociocultural, just on a slightly lighter note, because I know the politics of rage and polarization is not something that uh, you, you dine out on lightly. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting one <clears throat> that last year um, the film Joker uh, came out. And if you haven't seen it, go and see it because it mirrors the zeitgeist of our times. And interestingly, <coughs> excuse me, interestingly enough, you're seeing art imitate life and life imitate art, but in a lot of the protests around the world, people started coming out with Joker masks or painting their faces like the Joker. And if you look at the movie, it's about failed systems, about inequality, about um, injustices, social injustices um, to the bottom of the pyramid and not being able to survive. And this is the kind of the, the force that we've unleashed. In Hong Kong, slightly different, they're putting on Joker masks to stop facial recognition um, so that the Chinese government can't trace them, which they have been doing. So it's got a twofold effect uh, with that. Um, and then this one is a rather nice one. So there's two new stresses that we need to deal with. So in 2019, we started tracking bombardment stress. We all victims of bombardment stress. But now there is a new... Um, a new tribe, the ecosexuals. The ecosexuals, um, I want to read this to you because it's, it's, it's their, their manifesto. So basically, ecosexuals fundamentally mean that they're going to show Earth some love. The manifesto reads, We shamelessly hug trees, massage the earth with our feet, talk erotically to plants. Um, we are skinny dippers, sun worshippers, and stargazers. We caress the rocks. We are pleasured by waterfalls and admire the earth's curves. We make love with the earth through our senses. We celebrate our e-spots. We are very dirty. So, <laughs> are you an ecosexual or do you have eco-anxiety? That's a new thing. So people are becoming so pressurized about, do I go vegan? Do I eat plant-based foods? Do I not fly? Do I do all of those kind of things? Because I rent my clothing, so I'm trying to get into a circular economy and I'm trying to recycle and not buy fast fashion, but then somebody says, yeah, but what about the courier services that the e-commerce does to you? And if it's rental, they're going to have to um, dry clean all of that, so you're putting more pollutants into the air. So, again, I think we'll be in bunkers with uh, foil wrapped around our heads. Um, and then, last let flux, Generation Z. We have been tracking them for the past four years, before the first ones really started coming of age. They're now coming of age. I warn all of our retail clients and say, um, these guys are not only your consumers, and their social justice barometer is through the roof, um, but they're also your next workforce. All I can say is, charming. Welcome to 2020. Thank you very, very much.